Well, we're starting a new series today, and, um, and this, this series of messages is going to last over the next six weeks. And uh, it's based on Kyle Eidemann's book, Aha. And that word, Aha, it's, it's defined as a, a, a sudden understanding or a recognition or a resolution. It's, it's one of those times in, in life when, you know, a light bulb goes off, right? We've, we've all had those. You, think, you may even say, ah, you know, Aha, or, you know, now, now I get it. So maybe you experienced one of these. Maybe you were back in, maybe you were back in high school and you were sitting in math class and algebra class, and, and finally that equation clicked. You're like, ah, you know that that's how you do that. Or, or maybe you were in church and the preacher said something, and and that which was kind of cloudy to you, you didn't you didn't fully understand. It became clear. Or, or maybe it was the first time you figured out how to use the internet or, or Facebook or something, and. You know, you've been doing some stuff wrong for a while, and you've been posting things you're like, okay, now I understand, you know, what this button means. You know, what, whatever it may be. And sometimes those lessons that we learn can actually be painful. I remember learning an aha moment when I was young. It wasn't really something for me, but it was a buddy of mine. We were out. Uh, I had a, when I was, uh, I think it was in fourth grade, I got a, uh, a, a dirt bike. It was a Honda 75 dirt bike. I loved that motorcycle. And uh, I still remember vividly the day that I got it. Uh, my dad actually surprised me with it. I was not expecting it. Um, but I used to run around the house with a helmet on all the time and, you know, act like I was riding a motorcycle. So I think they finally got, you know, tired of me doing that. I don't even know where I get this old helmet at. But it, I think it finally, like, you know, in order for us to get him out of the house or get this helmet, you know, him out, you know, we're, we're going to have to do something so he, can, so he can ride. But I didn't know that I was, you know, going to get a motorcycle. And I remember... I still remember, you know how you remember just certain things as, you know, when you're really young, and I was just pulling up, I was riding the bus home, fourth grade, it was almost, school was almost out, and there my dad was, he was pulling this motorcycle out of, out of the truck, and I was like, yes, you know, I was so excited, and I remember one of my buddies that was riding the bus with me, he's like, you, you got a motorcycle? And, and, you know, again, I had no idea I was getting, I was like, yes, I do, you know, I got and I was kind of, you know, it was, it was sort of the big thing there for a while. Um, but I was out riding my motorcycle with one of with my buddy. He had a go kart, and he decided I don't know why, but he decided that he needed to check the oil in his go kart. And so that's fine. It's a good thing to check the oil, but it's not so good to check it while the engine's running. And so with a go kart, you open the you know where the oil goes. Hot oil goes all over him, <laughs> and you can laugh now. It's okay, but I mean, and he's okay. But I learned then. I was like, ah, oh, you know, you don't do that, right? You know, you don't check the engine oil in a go kart with it running. It will get all over you. It's a sudden understanding. It's a recognition. That's what aha is. But but these moments can go much deeper than that, right? I mean, they, they can go much deeper than algebra or Briggs and Stratton engines. I, I've listened as people have shared their aha moments with me over these years that I've been in ministry, and how God has suddenly somehow gotten their attention. And, and I've really never put it together as we're going to learn in this series that, that Eidelman teaches us. But these aha moments, they happen really when three key elements come together. There's got to be a, a brutal, a sudden awakening, a brutal honesty, and then immediate action. And maybe you can see that's what that little acronym AHA stands for, awakening honesty and action and so think of a sudden awakening like this maybe a, a desperate moment that somebody has maybe you hit rock bottom it's like an alarm going off in, in your mind you realize things are not good right things are spinning out of control a wife in her mid-30s returns home after meeting up with an old high school sweetheart they, they met online and decided they would meet up for lunch and they meet up and there's kind of this flurry of emotions and she He's still charming, and she feels 15 years younger. And, and then when she goes back home, she, she goes in the house, and she accidentally bumps over a table and knocks over a picture of her husband and her kids. And, and it's an aha moment, or it's a sudden awakening, rather. A college student's grades come in the mail, and his parting resulted in him flunking out of school. An addict wakes up in the hospital after an overdose. The divorce papers are left on the table. It's a sudden awakening. Right? There's just something happens like, whoa, this, this is not good. And then the second part is that there has to be brutal honesty. And this is the process of owning the problem. I found, I don't know if it's true, if you've discovered this as well, that, that we can be much more honest with other people sometimes than we actually are with ourselves. 
I don't have a problem, right? It's, uh, it's his fault. Things will get better. It's not that big of a deal. But in order for aha moments to happen, there's got to be a sudden awakening, but it has to be followed by a brutal honesty that where we own the problem, where we're real with ourselves. And then third, the third element here is immediate action. It's immediate action. No more excuses. No more procrastinating. It's time to make a change. And so this person takes the necessary steps to change his or her life. Maybe that's checking into rehab. Maybe it's uh, confessing a sin to a family member. Perhaps it's breaking away from a harmful relationship. Whatever it is, you decide that it's immediate, that, that immediate action must be taken. That's aha. It's awakening, honesty, and action. And when those three elements come together, everything changes. Everything changes, but you can't have awakening with no action. You can't just change your behavior and then, and then uh, you know, it, it still act like there's no problem. In order for aha to happen, all three of those ingredients must happen. And most of us have been here, right? I mean, we, we all probably have some aha stories to tell. And, and I'm hoping that you'll feel comfortable enough. I hope that you're in a small group. If you're not, afterwards, you, there's still time to sign up. Most of them, I think all of them will start today, but you can jump in. Maybe you'll want to share that during a small group. Maybe you'll want to share a small testimony on Sunday morning. I, I don't know what it may be. But we've all had those aha moments. And, and there's plenty of them in Scripture as well. We, um, perhaps the clearest example comes from the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, actually, I, we didn't show that video. Let's take a look at that, buddy. Can you pull that up real quick? It was the one that we were going to, yeah, take a look at this. You sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So we divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. Who sent him to the fields to feed his pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you were always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. All right, that's uh, whether or not you're familiar with the parable or not, you will be more familiar over these upcoming weeks because we're just going to sit on this, the parable of the prodigal son. Charles Dickens calls this famous parable the greatest short story ever told. And I couldn't agree more. And there's some powerful truths that we're going to learn about God, about ourselves, and about aha as we study it. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15, if you, if you want to go ahead and turn there in, in verse 11. Um, but before we get into this parable, we need to start at the beginning. 
Every story has a beginning, right? It has to start somewhere. There was always a, there's got to be a once upon a time, right? That's how most stories start anyway. That's how usually when I used to tell my girls a bedtime story or at least, you know, make one up, it was always once upon a time, a beautiful princess. It's been a while since I've done that. I need to, to do that more often. But there was always a once upon a time. So let's see if you can name this story by its beginning, all right? So if you know what it is, you can just shout it out. Uh, you're allowed to do that. It's okay. So, all right. So here's the first one. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. What is that? Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah. I'm going to be a little more impressed if you can get this one. This is, this is one of my favorite openings, though. Marley was dead to begin with. Christmas Carol. Good, yeah. Charles Dickens. Some of you, some of you knew that. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Tell two cities, yeah. Beginnings are important, aren't they? And they set the stage. They tell what it's like, you know, bef- you know uh, what life's like before you get into the middle of their narrative. And sometimes the beginning of the story often says a lot about the end of the story. I mean, you can't have a rags to riches story unless you know about the rags, right? There's no story. And so we're going to spend some time at the beginning of the story today. And because it sets the stage. It tells what life was like before the story takes place. And maybe even gives us a hint about the end of the story. Luke 15, verse 11. Look what it says. It says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So the story immediately we see, it begins at home, right? The father has two sons, and they are at home together. They live together. There's an estate where they work together. And the father obviously isn't poor. He has enough wealth that the younger son wants it. They have a good life. And if you read the end of the story later in in Luke 15, you know that the father has livestock and servants. Home is a good place to be. But there's something in this younger son that makes him want to leave home. I mean, no matter how good it is, no matter how well he's provided for, no matter how much his family loves him, he wants to leave. And so the younger son comes to his father and says, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance. I'm out of here. And when the the son asks his father for the share of his inheritance, he's essentially saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead. Now, that wouldn't go over in any culture well. But it wouldn't especially where in a culture where a father could have legally beaten his son for saying such a thing. The son obviously has some, some major character flaws, and, and he treats this, his father with the utmost respect by, uh, by this request. Dr. Kenneth Bailey lived and taught in the Middle East for many years. He said he's only heard of this happening twice, this scenario where a younger son comes to the father and asks for his inheritance before he dies. He said in the first case that he was familiar about, the the son was chased out of the house by an angry father. By the angry father. That would probably be most of our reactions, right? You know, are you kidding me? Uh, you know, you better go on somewhere else. The second, he said, the father who was previously healthy died within three months. Now, there's part of me that wants to kind of give this younger son the benefit of the doubt a little bit, right? I mean, while he's disrespectful and selfish and, and whatever else you want to say about him, maybe he didn't really want to break his family's, his father's heart. Right? I mean, he probably never meant to destroy his family, the relationship with his, with his father, with his brother. He, and, you know, this is a selfish ambition that he has, but maybe this kind of started out like that. He just didn't want anybody looking over his shoulder. He wanted to do things his own way. But it ended up costing him more than he ever could imagine. And for us on this side of the story, this younger son, he's crazy. He's lost his mind. He's got it great at home. You know, what's he doing? Why would he leave? Why would he be so foolish, Right? But my guess is that if we're really honest, that all of us would have to admit that we've left home too, right? Now, I'm not just saying that you, you know, leaving the house where you grow up as a kid, right? That, that's a healthy thing to do. You know, at some point, you know, y'all going, you know, kids, you got to go, right? I mean, eventually, that, that, that's, that's, that's healthy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about home like the home in this parable where the father is, because you know that the father in this story represents more than just a fictional father, right? 
In this parable, when the younger son leaves home, he's essentially leaving God behind. God represents the father in this parable that Jesus is is telling. And just as the younger son wants to leave home and turns his back on God, what makes us want to do the same thing? I mean, what makes us want to live a life apart from a good father who has cared for us and who has provided for us and just so we can go do it on our own? Well, for some of you, perhaps the problem is that you don't think of God as good. Maybe you're like Justin who ran away from God. He headed to a distant land because he felt like God was an unreasonable father. Maybe you felt like that. Maybe you felt like God wasn't reasonable. Justin was convinced that staying with the father was causing him to miss out. There's things out there going on and, and, and you know, God's way are just too restrictive. His path is just too narrow. And God does give us boundaries for our protection, but they see Him as a fence, right, that imprisons people. They see God as unreasonable. It's just unreasonable to follow a God like that. Or maybe you see God as an unpleasable Father. I heard someone recently share with me about how she always felt like she could just never measure up. How as a child and and growing up and being in church that God and his standards were just too hard and that every time she went to church she actually felt like a failure that she felt like that that she just couldn't she just couldn't live the life that that God wanted to and and maybe you felt the same way I mean maybe you grew up in a home where you felt like your best was never good enough right I mean you you got you brought home a B on your report card it should have been an A you, you, you scored 15 points in a basketball game. Well, it should have been 20 points. And so God seems like an unpleasable father. And I'm not sure if unpleasable is even, even a word, but you just go with me here, right? Or, or maybe you've left a distant country for a distant country because you see God as an unmerciful father. Maybe you were taught, you grew up, that, that God was always angry and that he just finds pleasure in punishing people and sending people to hell. That, that God was just unmerciful and that he was just angry. And so you just want to run and hide. You don't want to have anything to do with a God like that, right? I mean, that, and that's kind of what Adam and Eve did. I mean, remember what they did after they sinned? Natural thing for them that they hid, right? They were embarrassed. They knew that they had done wrong. But what did God do? I mean, God dealt with their sin, but what was the first thing he did? He showed compassion. He clothed them. And of course, ultimately, God has shown us this incredible mercy by sending Jesus to the cross to to die for my sin and for yours. And then there's some who see God as an uncaring father. They feel like God wasn't there for them when they, they needed him most, and so they set out for the distant country. Maybe life didn't go as they planned. Maybe you've experienced some type of suffering And and these are sometimes often, these are people who have been hurt by their maternal parents, and they blame God as a result, right? I mean, their attitude is, well, if God doesn't care about me, and again, they're thinking about their paternal parents as they think about God. Well, if God doesn't care about me, well, I don't care about Him. And so perhaps you've left, maybe that's why you left home. And again, when we're talking about home, we're talking about the Heavenly Father, and you, because you had this faulty idea about who God is. You, you thought maybe He was unreasonable or unpleasable, unmerciful, uncaring, whatever it may be. And that's why our theology is so important. How, you know, it's, it's important to understand, have a right understanding about who God is and who God isn't. We don't create God in our image. We're created in His. But you know, for most of us, I'm guessing that the reason that we've left the Father and we've headed off into this distant land is the exact same reason that the son did. I mean, we never really meant to destroy our relationship with our whole family. And we never really meant to cause all those problems. What started out as a little selfish ambition, doing things on our own, kind of going our own way, ends up costing us more than we ever imagined. And for many of us, we know God cares about us, and God has provided, and that God has saved us from our sin, and that God is good, that home is good. But there's something in us that wants to leave. We're like a moth that's just drawn to a light. 
we are drawn sometimes away from our Father and we can't resist and we, this urge, we have this urge and we just say, you know what, just give me my inheritance, just give me what I got. I'm just going to go now, I'm going to take it and I'm going to leave. But if we know that home is good, why would we leave in the first place? I mean, what would make this younger son want to leave his father's house? Well, one of the reasons that we want to leave and he left the father's house is because of instant gratification, right? Younger son comes to dad and says, Dad, I can't wait for you to die, so give me my inheritance now. I'm out of here. We want instant gratification, and we're not good at waiting either, are we? I mean, we're, we're used to instant messages and Instant downloads and instant popcorn and instant soup and, and you know and I mean if 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 I can buy something from Amazon today and UPS delivers it tomorrow I mean can't God speed up a little bit right I mean you know it, it shouldn't take that long and so money's short and you've prayed about it you've asked God to provide you but He hasn't provide for extra but He hasn't and so uh, you tweak the expense reports. Or you're going through a difficult time and you want to be happy, and, but you can't really find the happiness, and so you turn to drugs or alcohol. You've asked God to fix your relationship problems, but that just seems to be just too much. It's just really easier to find a new one. Or you can't afford something, but you want it anyway, and so our world has provided a fix, an easy fix, just going to debt. But a lot of the Christian life, a lot of living in the Father's house, it's based on delayed gratification. You're desperate for a relationship, but no one, but you haven't found someone who shares your faith. Nobody, that person is, isn't coming around, and so, so you wait. You, you've been praying for clarity about a situation. You've been asking God to give you clarity, but, but He hasn't, or you've been praying for your husband to accept Christ, or, or whatever it may be. Nothing seems to change, and so you wait. I mean, you've, you've got, we, we have the sure hope of heaven. But there's so much junk that's just going on in the world. And so we wait. We've been promised that all things will work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. But it sure seems like nothing seems to be happening. And so we wait. And after a while of waiting, it's easy to get sick of it and think, you know what, I don't want to wait any longer. I'm not going to wait any longer. And so we leave the Father's house looking for something that we think we should have. Instant gratification. I want it now. Another reason we leave the Father's house, and this is a dangerous mentality, but it's the, this I deserve it entitlement mentality. It's this attitude that says, I deserve it. Right? I've been working. I've been faithful long enough. Now I deserve a break. I've been good long enough. Now I deserve some fun. I've been patient long enough, and now I deserve some fulfillment, right? Feels a little something like this. Take a look. story the father represents God and the younger son represents well most of the rest of us I need more fries. if you've ever thought about chucking it all and starting over if you've ever thought that you wanted more and deserved better if you've ever felt like you were being held back or you were missing out or that you wanted to do things your own way then perhaps you can identify with this younger son Have you ever felt like that? I mean, like this, you're, you're in this never-ending reel, in and out, back and forth, going through the motions. You know, you're dealing with all the stuff that's going on, in and out of church, wondering, are you ever going to finally get the reward that you deserve? 
I've got a friend right now whose wife has left the father's house for a distant land. And the first time he shared this story with me, I was really surprised because I've only known her as someone to walk with Jesus. They've been married for a good while now. They actually planted a church together. But he said that she was discouraged because it didn't feel like to her that God was holding up his end of the deal. Again, she had been working hard and as faithful, but they were struggling somewhat financially. The church that they planted actually didn't make it. She had some relationship baggage with her earthly father and all of that now. And to quote my, my friend, he said, my wife is in a very dark place right now. Please pray for her. Pray for us. She's left the father's house for a distant land. And it's about to break my friend's heart. And he said this. He said, I've got this sick feeling. This was, broke my heart. He said, I've got this sick feeling that if she never comes back to the Lord, that I will have lost the most beautiful part of our marriage. I need help. We need help. And until she understands that she has a father who loves her and has blessed her, she's going to remain in this distant land. But it's this entitlement attitude that I deserve it. I deserve more. God, you should have been blessing me. God, you should have given me this or that that has her completely off kilter. And what this mentality forgets is that one of the core aspects of living a life saved by grace is that we don't deserve it. We don't deserve anything that God gives us. We aren't exempt in this life from pain. But praise God for His grace, His mercy through Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. And then the third common attitude that makes us want to leave the Father's house is this attitude of bitterness. And it says that I can do better on my own. <laughs> I can do better on my own. And I see this, I don't know about you, but I see this over and over and over and over again in life. And you really get this idea from the younger son. It's not that the father hasn't provided for him. It's not that there wasn't anything for him to do in the estate. There wasn't like he was anything lacking from the father. You just get the sense from this younger son, he wanted to do it on his own. He wanted to try his hand on his own, be his own master, lead his own life. And I think this attitude of the third, this third attitude is a kind of a combination of the first two. You want something now, you think you've earned it, you're tired of waiting, and so you just want to forget God and just kind of go out there and do it on your own. But what this attitude forgets is that the Christian life, and maybe it doesn't forget, maybe you just say, I, I don't want this. But that living in the Father's house, it's all about being a slave. It's all about being a servant. Paul says, I'm a servant of Jesus. And as servants, he calls the shots, not us. Right? I mean, we, we are his servants. He is the master. We are the children. Tim Keller says it like this. When you come to Christ, you must drop your conditions. You have to give up the right to say, I will obey you if. I will do this if. As soon as you say, I will obey you if, that's not obedience at all. You are saying, you are my advisor, not my Lord. And so we have all these reasons that the people decide, they make these statements, they leave the Father's house for a distant country. And we're going to talk about that distant country in this series and all the promises that it makes, everything that it promises, and yet everything that it fails to deliver. But here's one of the more fascinating things about God. And one of the things that we learn about Him from this parable that Jesus teaches us is that just like the Father in this story, He'll let us make those statements and walk away. He'll let us walk away. It's not that He likes when we do it. It's not that He couldn't stop it or do anything about it. But God is a God who allows us to choose Him or choose to leave him and a lot of us at one time or another maybe right now maybe we've said one of those statements to the father right god listen i want it now i deserve this i can do better on my own you know god listen i'm just going to try this thing and i'm just going to i you know and it starts off with a little request and a little control and a little harmless pleasure 
And you're not really trying to tell God he doesn't have any place in your life, but you're just like, you know what, I want to kind of try this on my own for a while. And you're not trying to tell God that he isn't number one, but I mean, can't there just be a close second? I mean, can't I just sort of do this? And you're not trying to tell God he's wrong about anything, he's wrong about marriage, don't you deserve to be happy? I mean, you're not trying to tell God that you don't want anything to do with him, but I mean, it's kind of silly for you to to give so sacrificially to, to, to church of the Lord when all your friends are driving brand new cars. I mean, we may not intend to tell God that we wish he was dead. But that's exactly what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. Here's the truth of the matter. We've all left the Father's house at one time or another. You've left the Father's house, haven't you? We've all left the Father's house at one time or another. It's not so much a question of whether or not you've left. Not even so much a question of what excuse that you use to leave. But here's the question. It's much more of a question of whether or not that you'll go back. Will you go back? Because the beginning of the story gives us a hint about the end of it. Where'd the story begin at? It begins at the Father's house. Nothing lacking. Nothing missing. Everything provided. Life is simple. Life is meaningful. <laughs> life may be difficult, but yet it's good. And the story could end there too. Listen, for you, it doesn't matter why you wanted to leave. What matters is whether or not you're willing to come back home. That's what aha is all about. And so maybe an aha story is beginning for you today. Maybe for you it's time to come home. And one of the incredible things that we're going to learn from this fascinating parable, the greatest story ever told, is that we have a Heavenly Father who loves us and who is waiting with arms open wide, waiting for us to come home. Today, if you've got a decision that that you want to make, we're going to sing a song here. And and we invite you to come forward. Maybe today you've never, maybe you've never experienced the love of the Father. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Today is a great day to do that. Maybe today that's an aha moment for you. Is that, you know what, I've been trying to do this on my own. I've been sort of, I've had one of these attitudes. Maybe I've had a misunderstanding about who God is. Today, I want to surrender my life to Him. I'm going to make Jesus my Lord. I'm going to be His servant. Or maybe today, maybe you do it right there. Maybe you make a decision coming forward that you just say, you know what? I'm going to go back to the Father's house. I've been trying to do this on my own. I've been trying things, you know, one way or the other. I'm going to repent of my sins and I'm, I'm going to come home. Whatever it may be, let's be standing.